Now, this is a, a remarkable opportunity we've got in the next hour because we've, uh, we've got uh, ministers, vi vice ministers and senior representative uh, from the Commission to really explore and get some insights on the reality of trying to get health inequalities policies um, uh, to work in government and then delivered on the ground uh, and, and how do you do joining up within government? How do you persuade colleagues uh, to recognise the importance of health inequalities? And the way we're going to do this, um, I'll introduce the panel first and, uh, and then we're going to have one um, speech just to frame the discussion and then we'll have a moderated discussion which I will kick off and then I'll open it up to the floor uh, later uh, in the hour. And um, so I'm going to just, on, on my right, obviously we've got uh, uh, Adonis as Minister of Health from Greece. Uh, then uh, Lee Franson, uh, Director of Social Policies in Europe 2020 in DG Employ. Uh, and then uh, to her right, you've met her already, uh, Francis Fitzgerald, Minister for Children and Youth Affairs uh, from Ireland. And then to her right, who you've also met, uh, Pilar uh, Far Farhas, uh, State Secretary of Health uh, in, in Spain. And then uh, you also uh, met him uh, this morning, Mark Drakeford, Minister for Health and Social Services uh, for the Welsh Government, uh, representing uh, the UK. And then uh, meeting for the first time uh, today, uh, Gedimas uh, Chirinaskas, uh, who is the Vice Minister of Health for Lithuania, and of course we should remember that Lithuania held the presidency until the end of 2013. So getting some reflections uh, from uh, the minister will be uh, immensely helpful. And then last but not least, on the far right, uh, Philippe Corland, uh, State Secretary for Social Affairs uh, and uh, Families, Persons with Disabilities and Scientific Policy for the Belgian uh, Government. Um, so I, I think you'll agree, a fantastic lineup. And uh, I'll invite Leave now just to give a, uh, a few remarks uh, to frame the discussion for us. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm very honored to be here with uh, all of these distinguished uh, ministers. And I'm a bit embarrassed to start, actually. I asked to speak late, last, but uh, I'm in your hands. So it seems that the Commission is asked to speak first this time. <laughs> Uh, it's a bit strange because I think the Commission's position is basically to support member states uh, and, and not, not really to, um, to do much more than that. I think bringing, back, bringing governments to diff different departments together is, is a very important area uh, in health and the fact that so many people also in the Commission have worked together with member states on this report and on the analysis is uh, some good beginning, I think, and I would like to uh, commend all of, all of the people working on this report. First of all, I see that you have already discussed a lot of the evidence, a lot of the areas of concern. I'm also impressed by the fact that actually health um, outcomes have measured as uh, child mortality and life expectancy have actually uh, converged more, whereas we see quite a lot of divergence going on uh, in, in Europe. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting um, specificity here that we see. But not only between countries, but also within countries, we still have a quite important inequality. And rightly, the report and your meeting here has recognized that this health inequalities, like poverty in general, has, uh, uh, is very multifaceted. So I would like uh, to focus on two areas of action in a way, two tools and instruments that we have to support member states. Uh, we here, I'm talking for DG Employment, uh, working with uh, different uh, departments, of course, uh, very closely together. I have two hats. Personally, I'm a medical doctor and public health expert, but I have the responsibility in the Commission actually to work on 2020, the social policies in 2020, and so uh, that, the strategy of 2020, and that's where I'm going to focus on. I would like to uh, mention two areas of uh, major work that uh, we need to be aware of because that's where action can take place also from our perspective. First of all, the uh, European semester, what we call the European semester, is an instrument to focus every year to see what the priorities are from member states on and how we support and recommend uh, changes or suggestions or recommendations uh, 
uh, for, for um, reforms. That semester exercise is launched with the annual growth survey that was uh, recognizing very clearly this year that better performing social protection is essential to support social change and reduce inequalities and poverty, including health inequalities, of course, because they are very linked to each other. Uh, poverty is sometimes a result of uh, bad health and the other way around also, uh, bad health can make people poor actually if social protection or health insurance is not organized uh, well enough. So to do this, we do this also together of course with all of the departments in the Commission but also with the Social Protection Committee that is uh, the Member States Committee, a treaty based organization in uh, where I'm representing the Commission, but each member state is represented there by different ministries, and they have the mandate for health and long-term care, pensions and social inclusion. And they are discussing actually the recommendations and the way forward and discussing also, um, I hope the, the, the report will also um, be discussed there uh, very extensively. They go from access to quality to equity, efficiency and effectiveness. Now this year there's also an innovation is that we have developed uh, together with the member states an evidence-based based assessment tool. So very, I'm trying to be concrete, this is focusing on action. So the joint assessment framework is for the first time really including this year the area of health. Focusing on health outcomes but also looking at not only aggregate indicators but also at the distribution of health and other in outcomes uh, across the population uh, and gender sensitive, educational uh, sensitive and so on. So I think this is a new way where I hope that we will in enforce and uh, reinforce our way of working together on health in the semester exercise. Um, Last year already in 2013 we had 11 uh, country specific recommendations to 11 countries on health, uh, sometimes going from in Bulgaria, Romania and Spain to access to health but also uh, on inequality of uh, outcomes in some other countries and very often related to poverty and microeconomic sustainability of course and making that balance between both is a, a difficult area also for most of the member states um, in difficult circumstances. So that's for the semester exercise. The second area we would like to briefly touch on is that we have last year adopted a new policy framework. The policy framework for social policy include an investing in health. It is also very child friendly with my uh, minister here on my right side under her presidency we work very much on the uh, child friendly social investment package and we launched uh, the, the, the investment package in a way also last year. So I call it a child friendly social investment package because one of the areas of course is children but also gender issues. It is an integrated package, part of it is, says also uh, develops uh, not only children but also health, investing in health. Uh, the Minister already uh, referred to this. So I think the, 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 the broad, the evidence you have worked on in, in the report is very important but also the policy framework is in place so rightly this meeting and this panel is focusing on action. So the action in the first, uh, in, on the social investment package focuses very much on how to make things not only in health, for health and within the health sector as efficient as possible and as effective as possible in addition to, to make it sustainable. Um, second, we also focus very much on participation and activation in, in, in labor market and see also opportunities of course in long-term care and healthcare services of better uh, employment uh, possibilities actually. And a third, um, the, the change in the policy is very much uh, focusing on more prevention and less, uh, not less, but more prevention and uh, early interventions in health, but also in preventing poverty, reducing poverty, rather than waiting until uh, people end up in, uh, in complex and difficult circumstances that are more difficult to uh, pick them out of this. And we are now working very specifically on 
uh, methodologies to support member states to make that trade-off of how efficiency and effectiveness and sustainability can be trade-off between the different policy areas, which is a very difficult area, between uh, the, the, what is the effect of childcare, for example, on, a, on women's labor, but also on women's health or on the household health and so on. So we have progressed quite well. Uh, several of the ministers have seen the presentation in that area already and have welcomed that very much. The last area that I don't want to detail on is of course we have also uh, structural funds. I understand that one of my colleagues has already uh, detailed this so I'm not going to in detail on that but we are in charge of the social funds and the social fund is of course also open for health. Uh, including uh, and other areas uh, that are, have an impact on health and we have uh, a specific um, budget also on social policy innovation where also of course health integrated services and so on can be um, tested in innovative approaches and we have a support system there uh, in place with the London School of Economics. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Levi. I think it was really helpful to just get that overview of the policy framework uh, at an EU level and some of the tools and, uh, and funding that is available. So um, turning now uh, to um, the rest of the panel, I wonder just to get us going if um, each of you might just say a little about how you have gone about uh, seeking to get health inequalities prioritised at a cross-governmental level within your own uh, countries and what you found has worked and maybe something about where you faced uh, barriers. Um, so um, uh, in no particular order, uh, maybe um, uh, 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 if Pilar Farhas may maybe start if that's okay. Many thanks, you know, you know, ministers. Actually, this is a great opportunity to be able to show how Spain's government intends to face the responsibility of introducing equity in all public policies. The government in Spain believes that it is a responsibility of all administrations to guarantee to citizens services which are basically uh, guaranteed for all. Uh, this also helps the efficiency of measures and allows social and economic development. On the basis of that principle, uh, which is enshrined in all the Spanish legislation, uh, we have specifically kept it in mind in decisions adopted within the uh, past two years in the times of economic crisis. Spain had to uh, come up with measures uh, um, of an economic nature and uh, efficiency uh, related measures and the reform in Spain uh, focused on the fact that decisions would allow better results, more protection and uh, specific protection for the most uh, vulnerable groups. Uh, three uh, fundamental elements here. The reform of the health sector in Spain guarantees the universal right to uh, coverage for all Spanish uh, citizens and residents in Spain. Now, the uh, National Health Survey of 2012 clearly shows that 98% of residents in Spain are covered, have health insurance in the National Health Service, first. Second, the biggest problem in Spain is unemployment. We have clearly identified as a restrictive aspect in pharmaceutical uh, services and products uh, the um, situation for unemployed people uh, has led us to change the system to account for the users. One million unemployed people, uh, long-term unemployed people that before paid 40% of the value of uh, med medicinal products now uh, uh, don't do so anymore. So these are covered by the National Service. Now, this morning we heard how the participation of citizens is essential here. And we are beginning to create a structure, a network of patients, which um, means that 20 million patients in Spain will be allowed to take part in the definition of policies for self-care and for strategic decisions. The data show it clearly, uh, enshrining equality and equity in 
health policies and in strategies for prevention and uh, all sorts of strategies in the health sector is a priority. And this allows us to guarantee that 77% of Spanish women in a risk category take part. They have their mammography and screening tests uh, and uh, cancer detection programs. These are some of the results of a strategy that we are beginning to apply uh, and uh, enshrine in all economic policies and, of course, in the health-related policies as well. Thank you. Thank you. And now turning to uh, Gedi Mas uh, from Lithuania. Thank you. Chairman, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to talk to you. And just uh, as Lithuania had presidency uh, last uh, half of the year, just a short reflection, probably related to the subject of our uh, uh, conference today. Uh, last year, uh, Europe had quite uh, <coughs> intensively debated issue uh, uh, reflecting idea uh, health is moral obligation like it was stressed today or value in itself like it was indicated by Commissioner Borge uh, and this discussion was about uh, tobacco directive. We know that Irish presidency managed to achieve agreement in the council, the Lithuanian presidency managed to, to get through negotiations between the parliament and council. It was not easy because some countries, some people advocated uh, uh, economic gains, profits of companies, some advocated public health gains and the result was that Europe voted for more for public health and, and that's important because in any case on one hand you have uh, risk of death for those who are smoking, usually they are poor, sometimes unemployed. On the other hand, of course, you have interest of those who are quite rich, earning from product. It was debate, but with quite clear answer by Europeans. Second issue, which was also important uh, last year, was discussion on sustainable health systems, uh, council conclusions on these systems. Uh, Maybe the paper is nothing very special, but discussions around this document indicated that uh, clearly health today is a very different thing if to compare with 50 years ago. We know that 50 years ago Europe was established as an agency to deal with coal, steel and agriculture. Yeah? Today we have no almost coal, no, almost no steel industry, very minor uh, resources invested in agriculture and we do have health and other social sectors that are one of major contributors not just to our health but to our employment to our competitiveness in the world as we are producing and selling devices selling uh, drugs and, and, and whatsoever our labor force depends on, 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 on good health so it's a role of health is very different and uh, we do need to understand more clear what does it mean health for Europe, Europe for health, because it's clear that uh, health is not anymore just a uh, uh, grandchild of, of those big industries. Today it's big industry and, and it's responsible for many things. So, so this different uh, role a health plays uh, needs more attention. It treats, needs probably also rethinking of policy making because we still Europe of uh, countries uh, without uh, no clear responsibilities for the Union what regards health. So with short comments on uh, uh, last year and few ideas about inequalities in Lithuania. Unfortunately my country is usually uh, represented as first uh, in most categories but from opposite side. Yeah? Our life expectancy if of males uh, uh, probably is the shortest in Europe, a bit different with women, but nothing much better. Uh, a commission's paper uh, indicated, uh, which was printed last year, very clearly that uh, the biggest uh, difference is not when you are looking for av average figures, but when you are looking for uh, <coughs> quality of life during working age. In working age, uh, Lithuanians die four times more often than people 
of Netherlands and some other countries and reasons uh, mainly are not related to health itself. For example, just now we have winter, yeah? here it's winter plus 5 or plus 10, in Lithuania it's minus 15, minus 20, and usually we have about 300 deaths because of cold per year. Uh, difficult to imagine that this is Europe, that is 21st century, but it's still the case. So example of really issues should be tackled, our weaknesses, our problems. On the other hand, you may say that nothing so not, not everything is so bad in, 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 in my place of birth. Uh, for example, when we have a political will, uh, we are able to change. Like in 2007, uh, we introduced quite efficient, well-known and well strategies to reduce uh, accidents, car accidents, and we managed to reduce deaths in car accidents threefold during four years. So it's example when you may do, and it's a continuation of what we were listening today, that countries, if we have a political will, if we're using international experience, knowledge, this is available, may achieve quite a lot. Sometimes lacking behind, but hoping for the future. For next uh, 10 years, a uh, country has plans to tackle those issues, what I mentioned, with uh, dying from uh, cold, uh, dying because of drowning, dying because of, of uh, accidents at home, and, and this uh, really avoidable deaths today is the biggest resource of, of good health for the nearest future. We will see how these ideas will be implemented on us. Thank you. I really like the way that some very um, practical steps are being taken to, to reduce um, uh, particular problems. Um, turning to Belgium now, and uh, Philippe Courland, the State Secretary. Um, Philippe, would you just give us a Belgian perspective on the same question, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. Perhaps I could remind you of a few basic points. And I'll just wait till everyone's got their headsets on. Perhaps I could remind you that social security is a real way of protecting people against the crisis. And all too often we have the feeling that some countries have forgotten that. Social security is a way of combating inequalities. It's essential. And we can see in the figures here for our country that we have managed to resist quite well, not that we couldn't do better, not that people still aren't suffering difficulties and suffering because of the crisis, but we have managed to avoid a lot of the terrible destruction that can come about when you don't have that social safety net. Combating inequalities, of course, means that we need a more holistic, integrated approach. We have to look at the determining factors for health. If you have someone who can't go to work because they're ill, if that person isn't within a framework, if they're not looked after, then they will have a whole series of problems, and we have to be able to deal with that. We also have to make sure in education, when people aren't being educated properly, we know that that will have consequences. What are the factors important if we want to be successful? Well, you need to bring all of the stakeholders together, and not just health stakeholders. You need to have a cross-cutting policy, and you know that Belgium is a complicated country because of its institutional framework. But we do need to make sure that we're talking to each other and we have interministerial conferences so that we can define our priorities and put in place plans for implementing those priorities. We try to involve all of civil society so that together we can define our operational objectives. When we're fighting inequalities in healthcare, we do so as part of a sustainable development strategy. We can see that all of these points that we need to implement are interdependent. 
Of course, we have to break the vicious circle of people living in a precarious situation. We need to make sure that people, vulnerable people don't fall into a downward spiral. Our economic and financial policies can help with that as well. If we want to support the social security systems in our countries, if we want them to be effective, we need to have more prevention, we need to effectively treat people, keep people healthy, and that will help us to spend less later on. Sometimes when we're talking about the cost of all this, we should perhaps talk about investing more in social help because that can cost a lot less in the long run and help the population. So I have two brief messages for you. I think that Europe should impose a social agenda. I think it's now or never really. We can see the image that Europe has, and which is why I and my colleagues are asking for more Europe. Europe isn't always well understood by citizens because it's not s social enough. It's not distributing fairly enough among its citizens. We need to make sure that Europe supports us in this process. I also think that Europe can support us in Belgium to make sure that all the communities get round the table and draw up their plans and objectives. Europe can play a very important role in that. We want to have a strong Europe and Belgium is very keen to continue working on equity action we will always consider it as being our contact partner for a citizen-centred Europe. Thank you. Thank you, State Secretary. And I'd now like to turn to Francis Fitzgerald, uh, the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs from Ireland. I mean, Ireland uh, had to impose a pretty strict austerity approach. How have you managed to protect uh, public, public health and health inequalities during that period? That has been a very challenging question, and I think across Europe it has been. How do you keep a priority focus on health at a time of economic uh, challenge such as we've seen? Uh, I suppose just to say a few words about overall health statistics in Ireland. Um, you know, the picture is one of, of continuing progress, but at a slower rate. And I think that's what we're seeing across Europe generally. Um, and that's in the context, as you say, of very significant uh, financial constraints. We have the rapid aging of the population. And then we have the lifestyle-related health issues, which we discussed earlier, um, which really have the potential to jeopardize a lot of the progress um, which we have already made. And uh, that is a huge challenge, I think. One of the reasons we do need to focus on these public health priorities is that very demand on our health services, because the cost of funding our health services all over Europe um, is clearly not sustainable. And, you know, clearly we're moving into a period when hopes of greater economic growth. But even given that, uh, sustaining uh, our health services with the kind of demand levels that are on them is going to be very difficult. And so I think um, the question uh, is asked uh, in, in, in this session uh, what's attractive uh, you know, to politicians, to ministers in relation to dealing with health inequality. But clearly that's a very key uh, factor. Um, it is that cost of our health services at present and the gains to be made if we can interrupt, keep the gains we've made and interrupt the cycle uh, in terms of those uh, lifestyle issues uh, which we've been discussing. A broad point I'd like to make is that I do think we all need to work harder at ensuring uh, that the debate at European level um, is a debate uh, that is economic and social. And when we're talking about economic progress or economic goals or when our commissioners are speaking about the future of Europe, that we get a more balanced description of, of Europe and the goals of Europe and we discuss the question of economic growth for what. And uh, I do believe that the financial crisis, which has taken up so much time uh, and so much uh, of the public airways, has really led to far less focus on these social and health issues. And we do have to reclaim that territory, I believe, to, to answer your question. I think that's a real challenge, and we do have to invent the ways um, from the highest level right across uh, at, at, at political, at commissioner, uh, every place. We do have to reclaim that debate and you know, say once again just how, how terribly important um, it is. Um, that is absolutely critical. I think when we're talking about economic policies, we really have to talk as well about the social policies the social gains uh, that we make by getting our, our growth uh, back. 
In terms of uh, uh, ministers uh, being, uh, the question again, attracted and wanting to work on health inequalities, I, whole, I think the whole focus that has been here has been about a broader definition of health uh, that includes community development and engaging that broader range of stakeholders. I think there's a huge democratic gain in that. Um, in terms of citizen participation and citizen uh, engagement. And that whole focus on community development will, will do a great deal for that. And it means that we are uh, working from government uh, and NGO, NGOs, working together in the interests of our people, in the interests of parents, in the interests of children. Um, and that is a very uh, attractive proposition, given the kind of gains that we know that we can make. Um, another reason, I think, for us to try and get this whole question of health inequalities uh, to feature more centrally in political debate is that it, it, it builds in very well, I think, with a narrative which is very strong in Europe at, at present, which is that reform narrative, um, that we do have to reform the way we approach health. And I would say, again, uh, there is quite a responsibility, I would feel, on health practitioners uh, to share their knowledge and make sure that that knowledge is uh, out there in the community and we use all of the various mechanisms in order to do that. So um, I would say that um, what we've done in Ireland is we have taken a decision to move towards universal health. Uh, we have recently introduced um, free GP care, it's a very early intervention, early primary care, I think that's really important. I believe the kind of initiatives that have been taken at EU level, for example, around the youth guarantee are going to make a difference as well. And if some of that funding uh, could be used to not just you know, work on very um, traditional methods of engaging with those who are unemployed, but to, do, uh, to take what Equity Action, uh, Equality, uh, Equity Action has said in their paper on the effects of unemployment and mental well-being of young people, uh, to have that broad approach between departments of health and departments of social protection. I think if we do that, we'll be working more at a preventative level and intervening effectively uh, in the young people who are currently uh, facing unemployment. So they're just some initial thoughts. So an economic, a social and a democratic uh, case um, uh, to underpin the drive against health inequalities. So turning now to Mark Drakeford uh, from the Welsh Government on behalf of the UK. Mark, um, do you just want to give us your reflections, please? Well, thank you, Chair. And just to go back to the question you, you started with, what are the advantages and disadvantages that governments face in tackling health inequalities? I feel in many ways very fortunate in Wales in being part of a government that has as our ambition the creation of a more equal Wales. And that means that health inequalities are seen in a slightly broader cross-government way. Uh, we believe in a more equal country because more equal countries do better economically. They have less crime. They have less fear of crime. They have a greater sense of solidarity. And they have fewer health inequalities. Uh, but that means that health inequalities are positioned in that broader equality thrust. Um, it means, thinking back to this morning, that if we are interested in health inequalities, you wouldn't always start with a health minister. Um, you certainly wouldn't only talk to a health minister. You have to talk to all those other parts of government who are responsible for creating the conditions in which either health inequalities widen or can be eroded. Um, at the heart of our approach, then, is an enduring uh, belief that um, good government is good for you and that government can still be a collective vehicle in which we can solve common problems. Now, that's not an uncontested uh, position. There's a perfectly respectable, different view of things that believes that societies uh, do best when governments do best, do least. Um, but that's not the approach we have taken, and that allows us to have that sense of optimism that I think we talked about this morning, that even when faced with apparently intractable problems, concerted and collective action can continue to make a difference to them. On the um, challenge side, of that. I think that in the United Kingdom, uh, at least, for all its 
very many uh, strengths. One of the difficulties in the 21st century of our classical welfare state is that somewhere at the heart of it, it positioned the relationship between people who provided and people who use services in this sort of way that all the expertise, all the power lay on the side of the table of the individual or the organization providing the service and the person using the service was characterized as the passive object of those people's concerns. And I think one of the things that we are trying to work hard at is a reformulation of that relationship between the citizen and the state, between the user and the provider of services on the basis of what we call, and it may be a term familiar to others here, a basis of co-production. Um, a belief that services work best when the strengths and the contributions of people who provide services and use services are recognized as being equally valuable and equally important. They are different, of course, but their value is equal if we are to drive the sorts of outcomes that we are looking for. So while government can create the conditions and has a responsibility to create the conditions in which health inequalities can be addressed, in the here and now, most of the things which individuals are able to do to make an impact on their own health tend to lie in their own hands. Decisions about whether you smoke, whether you drink sensibly, whether you exercise, whether you eat a reasonable diet and so on. And public health right across Europe, it seems to me, has succeeded in creating a citizenry which is better informed. It has succeeded sometimes in creating new intentions amongst people, but we are yet to persuade people to move from intention to action. And the new relationship, the co-productive relationship, goes to something that Francis was saying uh, a moment ago about if health services are to succeed in the future and if health inequality gaps are to be narrowed, then we have to match government action with a greater sense of awareness amongst the population about the things that they can do and indeed have a responsibility to do in order to shape their own health and to deal with the health of those that they live amongst. So I think I'll, I'll end there, but it's a combination of optimism about the role of government together with a redrawing of the relationship between what governments can do and what we will have to expect in the future citizens to be able to do more for themselves. So I'm about to throw this open to you to ask uh, uh, questions either of a specific uh, panel member or um, uh, the panel as a whole. But before I do, I'm just going to invite um, uh, uh, Adonis uh, Georgiadis, who kicked us off, just have the opportunity to reflect on, on the things that he's heard and uh, you know, the applicability, particularly in terms of the EU presidency. Thank you very much, Aaron. Um, I think we are dealing with a problem that looks like the Gordian knot that Alexander the Great had to court uh, 2,500 years almost before. You see, Sir Marmot, the population is aging, so the needs are more, but the budgets are becoming lower. The technology is more efficient, but more expensive. So we have to deal with these uh, three things and find a better way. I think the key word here is the reforms. What our government decided to do in Greece, and uh, I'm sure in Spain, in Ireland, in Lithuania, and everywhere else, is try to find a way to spend the money of uh, the tax holders in a much more efficient way. Because in the past, there was uh, too much waste of money because uh, when the things were coming to health, all governments would say, give the money. But at the end, this was not a good idea. I think that if we follow the WHO instructions of the primary health care, and if we persuade the civilians, as, as now was said, to understand that 
Each one of us has a responsibility for its health. And uh, being a member of a, of a community, it means that you cannot uh, wait that uh, a government that will come from the God will solve all the problems. This cannot happen. We will have to work each other, the government, the organizations, the experts, and to find a way to make, to make it happen. Because in the general idea, everybody here and in the European Union agree that this is the aim we have to, we have to, to achieve. We have to make it happen. And our responsibility and our generation's responsibility is to find a way to do it. I'm really optimistic that at the end of the day we will do it. And you know that I'm coming from a country, but in the last three years, I'm sure you have heard something, we are dealing with some small problems. <laughs> so, but we're still here, uh, we're exiting the crisis, and this was not very easy, and uh, many of you, I presume, were betting uh, that we wouldn't make it. But we're here. So that means that if we can deal with each other, understand each other better, uh, we can find a way out and uh, do our world much better as we really want to do it. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take three points at a time. If you would just keep them short, I'd be really grateful. So I've got a gentleman over here, and I've got the lady who's waving her arm, arm vigorously um, at the back here. I am Jean-Pierre Baez, representative for the European Union Geriatric Medicine Society. A lot has been said about children, and I am very happy. But as the Minister of Health said, uh, we see our population ageing. And in fact, in the uh, care for the very frail older people, the frail older people, we move from inequality to discrimination. Indeed, the medicines are tested, the clinical trials are only done in young, active people and are not performed in frail older people. So one in three older people admitted to the hospital, this admission is in relation with the use of medicine that is not adapted for these people, not tested for these people. This medicine is prescribed off-label, in fact. That's a real problem, and I should ask all the ministers to do something to that, because our efforts at the European Medicine Agency, now from 10 years, give no result. We are happy for the children. There is a pediatric committee, but still we need a geriatric committee, and it will save a lot of money. Thank you very much for that question. And uh, the lady at the back? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Natalie from Doctors of the World International Network. Uh, thank you, Kyrie Yorgadis, for your commitment to restore access to health care for most vulnerable people without stigmatizing any part of the population, like migrants, sex workers, or drug users. That was really great for us to hear, to hear you. As you said, Europe is a place where solidarity means a lot, and Greece is living a very harsh situation, we all know. So we need more solidarity towards Greece, especially knowing that over a third of the people now don't have any health coverage, and their children don't access vaccination. Some don't even get birth certificates when the parents cannot pay the delivery. So I think that what your commitment really is a hope. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll take one more. Now there was a lady over here. Yeah. I heard that you were asking for a more holistic approach of closing the gap and also a broader definition of health. Mrs. Fitzgerald was talking about that. Well, we do have a way of holistic approach, and that is homeopathy. And in Belgium at the moment, it's a very uh, urgent to have a legalization of homeopathy. Because in homeopathy, we are dealing with all those social determinants that you are talking about. Well, my question is, especially for Mr. Philippe Collard, who is here instead of Mrs. Onkelings, what about an European vision on legalization of homeopathy in contradiction to the Belgian vision? Thank you very much. 
Okay, uh, right. I think that, that final question has taken us uh, a little bit by surprise, but we will deal with it. So, um, so the second um, question first, and uh, which was really direct to you, um, uh, Adonis. So, would you uh, like to address the questions about Greece, please? Uh, yes, of course, I would like to answer. Um, in, in Greece, we have many problems, but they are not uh, in, in, the, in the scale that it was mentioned before. First of all, all the uh, vaccination is being done properly. And if you see the OSA uh, report and the WH report, we're in the EU uh, level, and this is total lie that we let our children without vaccination. Second, there is not even one children, one child in Greece that doesn't have the proper paper of uh, the birth. This is not true. Uh, so this is not happening. We have a great problem with the uninsured people, and you were right, uh, it's not very easy for them to take their medicine, but if they go to the hospital, they will give, uh, we, will, we are giving them the medicine for free. And the uninsured, and the immigrants, and uh, everybody else. So, the crisis is huge, but Greece still remains a European country. And I just wonder, on the question of ageing population, um, whether anybody would, uh, from the panel would choose to just address those points about um, uh, discrimination against older, older people. Would you, would you take that, please? Yeah. So, the Spanish Minister. Gracias. Yes, thank you. Well, Spain has one of the highest life expectancies of the European Union, and we certainly uh, put uh, older people as a high priority. But one of the strategies that we managed to uh, enshrine in terms of equity is precisely one of the main pillars that will allow us to focus uh, health uh, efforts in Spain by trying to correctly identify the highest risk population, older people, vulnerable people with uh, chronic pathologies, and we're going to increase and speed up the uh, implementing of e-health as a very powerful instrument uh, that will guarantee continuity to uh, assistance on a long-term basis. And we identify older people as a high-priority group in terms of prevention strategies and, and strategies to promote health. We think that with equity and with the reduction of inequalities in Europe, uh, the chronic uh, aspect uh, here, the e-health uh, dedicated to older people in particular, will be very important, the most powerful instrument that we have at our disposal in order to give this extra added value and better quality of life to all European citizens. leave on the same question. On, on ageing, I, I, I understood your question very specifically on testing, yeah. uh, which is of course interesting and, I, and you are totally right. Uh, I think uh, th there has been a time where medicines were not even tested on children or on women and now on older people, so there is an issue of specific testing for different populations and uh, and you have a, a full point. But I would like to uh, raise also the issue on, uh, on aging because we focus on, on the crisis a little bit uh, with Greece and, and, and Ireland and, and at the whole uh, situation in Europe actually has really focused us very short term on the crisis. But in the meantime, what we have is really an aging population and a changing demography. And that is really... Uh, in, and an, an increased cost of health, uh, more need for long-term care. So there is a major reform needed also in our thinking in the longer term beyond the crisis. The crisis at a certain stage will be overcome, but we will not be in the same situation as before the crisis. So the reforms that we're talking about are really in, 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 
in, uh, important for the longer term. And I would not like to come to, uh, to an, an, a generation battle in a way. And so your question is right. But for the moment, what we see actually is a very serious increase in child poverty more than in older uh, population poverty, for example, where what we see increased poverty among women in older age. And, and that is also something invisible. So the demographic situation is important also. And uh, um, Philippe, would you mind briefly dealing with this uh, question, specific question about homeopathy and the uh, Belgian legislation? We don't consider On the point about homeopathy, during this legislative term, we have been looking at non-conventional types of medicine, and we're trying to put together a framework there we are trying then to recognize people who are doing their jobs properly and make sure then that patients don't go to see charlatans because there are unfortunately some of those around. I think at a European level it's a little premature, a little early to be thinking about this, but that's something we could envisage as well. We are working upstream on determinants to develop our national strategies for sustainable development and we're doing that with all of our departments as I said earlier we do want everybody to be involved in this process so we can move forward on determinants thank you now we've uh, pretty much run out of time but uh, no it's okay if um, uh, Francis if you would like to make a final comment that's, that's right. fine no, and then I, we'll wrap up thank Sorry. you very much I, I was just going to make a point that we do have to be very vigilant about ageism and I think the concept of interge intergenerational solidarity is one that we can develop and it, it, it isn't children against older people but that intergenerational uh, concept I really need, think we need to think more about and also perhaps look at more research into models of community care that are really effective. I think that's an area for future research because we have an aging population, we are going to be supporting more of them in their homes and we need to really examine the ways we're doing that and not assume that certain models work but really examine that as well from a research perspective. Very good. So just briefly summing up on the discussion that we've, we've heard, um, despite the fact that obviously the ministers come from different countries and different perspectives, I drew out really three key uh, drivers for getting ownership across a national government. One was the importance of economics and making the economic case and investing up front in terms of tackling uh, determinants um, to save resource uh, uh, further down uh, the line, uh, particularly in terms of the healthcare uh, system. Uh, the second was a social case, uh, which was one about fairness and about distribution and about closing uh, the gap. And the third was a democratic case. Uh, and the importance of actually designing and producing uh, uh, systems uh, with uh, the population themselves and getting their ownership on, in recognition that while the state has got a very important role to play, it can't do uh, everything. So I thought it was a really rich discussion. I'm very grateful to the whole panel. And will we show our appreciation, please? Thank you very much. Yeah. It will now just be a